Let's uh, go to Lord in prayer, and we'll go ahead and begin. Um, just for update, uh, last, last week, none of the audio went through, so I'm going to review uh, 8.3 again, and uh, we'll f- go ahead and finish this chapter as well. So some of it will be review, but for the sake of recording, hopefully that'll be okay. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you for this day, and thank you for all that you give us. Um, we pray that uh, we can come here resting from our labors, eager to enjoy fellowship uh, with fellow believers and eager to be fed by your word. We thank you for this additional hour of Sunday school that we can continue to learn, help us learn about Christ, and uh, may he be glorified in his name. Amen. Okay, so we are in chapter 8, Christ the Mediator. All right, Christ the Mediator. We're going to pick up from where we left off last time. We're going to look at a few Uh, passages that we didn't get to look at last time as well, and hopefully conclude all paragraph three. So remember, as far as the flow, let's just kind of think of the flow of the confession, right? We are, it's very logical, and it's wanting to show us that there's a way to think through these things in a way that is is, uh, edifying, in a way that uh, makes sense. So chapter one, we look at of the scriptures, right? Of the scriptures, because everything we're deriving in this confession is coming from the scriptures. So we need to know, what do we believe about the scriptures? What do we uh, understand them to be? And so how did they come about? So we look of the scriptures first. Chapter two, who remembers what chapter two is about? So after scriptures, we have what? What's that? Yeah, so doctrine of God. Uh, Doctrine of God. So doctrine of God, who is God? Who do we understand him to be? Um, We understand him as the Godhead in Trinity. And so in order for us to then further understand from the rest of the confession who this God is, what is he doing, uh, what is his nature, um, we understand, we have to understand who God is. Now, the the only way we can do that isn't through special, isn't through um, natural revelation, isn't through looking at nature and saying, oh yeah, this is who God is. We can understand that to a degree, but we need the scriptures. So that's why it's important to start with chapter one and understand what do we believe the scriptures to be. Uh, they are inspired and they help us interpret reality. Well, uh, chapter two is of the Trinity. We understand that uh, God is one in being and comprised of three persons. doesn't mean three separate people, but one God and three persons. And so Father, Son, Holy Spirit. This God then made a decree. So in chapter 3, we see it flow from there. He made a decree. What is the decree? If you were to just sum it up briefly, how would you sum up maybe chapter 3? Blueprint, yeah. When did he make this decree? Before the foundation of the world. Good, yeah. So the decree is before the foundations of the world. Notice from all eternity, it's this plan to execute uh, all of redemption. And so it's the blueprint. That's a good, a good way to look at it. It's made before eternity passed. So we can look at this as really uh, the covenant of redemption kind of language where the Godhead is decreeing to save sinners. The Father has a role. The Son has a role. The Holy Spirit has a role. Um, We learn about predestination as well and election through these things. And once God then uh, understand, uh, once we understand these things, we understand that God orchestrates these things. Uh, He has to make make it into uh, creation. So that's chapter four. So you can plan, you can make a blueprint. Now he actually facilitates his plan in time and space. That comes by way of his creation, right? So we understood his creation in chapter four. God made male and female. He made all the other creatures as well, but male and female are made in his image. The law is written on their hearts, and it's these people that he's seeking to send his son particularly to redeem. It's those whom were chosen before the foundation of the world. Chapter 5 is then talking about how God upholds the world. So he plans, he creates, and now he upholds. We call this what? What is, what's that? 
governing or providence. Now, today in the sermon, we're going to see providence in working uh, in the life of Ruth and Boaz, and, or not yet, we'll see that next week, but particularly for Naomi and her family and how God can work even in providence, even in the midst of loss and difficulty. So God, doctrine of providence is actually very crucial for the believer so you can interpret what's happening even in hardships and when things seem like uh, there is no God. How do we understand all these things? Providence tells us he's upholding, he's governing every little thing from the smallest detail to the grandest thing. Um, he is doing this all because of his plan that he created before the foundation of the world. So providence is the maintenance and execution of that plan. Chapter 6, we learned about the fall and sin and the punishment thereof. So Adam in the garden, he sinned. Uh, God was given, given him a covenant of works, do this and live, to where he can merit life, uh, or he merited the covenant curses, which is death upon disobedience. So the law was written on his heart. He enjoyed fellowship with God upon disobedience. He was cast out of the garden east of Eden, and in so doing, all of the land and all of the world really was tainted by sin. The punishment thereof is the wages of sin is death. As a result, now we're all corrupt in nature. We're sinful. So then God makes a covenant by which he's going to redeem humanity, reverse the effects of the fall. We see this in chapter 7 of God's covenant, right? And so God does this through the covenant of grace. The covenant of grace has been revealed first in the gospel, all the way from Genesis 3.15, and is progressively revealed more and more until the fullness of Christ comes, until the cross. Um, and so we see this, which brings us then to chapter 8. Christ is the mediator of that covenant. So you can see how all this logically flows from chapter 1 all the way to chapter 8. It's building upon each other. Every chapter does, but it also, we'll notice, looks back. It, it remembers where we were. It recalls us. So it's looking ahead and constantly looking back. So that's why it's important to just review every now and then as we see this. So we learn about Christ the mediator. He is the mediator of the covenant of grace. He was, it was according to the covenant made before the foundation of the world, the covenant of redemption. He was, elect, he was chosen to be a prophet, priest, and king. And in so doing, he's our savior. Uh, he is the savior of the church. Um, as he's executing these roles of prophet, priest, and king, he's doing it as a representative. He's accomplishing our justification, sanctification, glorification. It's the process of that unbreakable chain of redemption. And so he's our perfect prophet, priest, and king. Um, in so doing, uh, we see, we learn more in chapter, or paragraph two, that how he was, how he, he became the God-man, right? He was very God, yet he's also very man, or truly. Um, one in substance with the Father, yet in his humanity, he added humanity and he is able to relate to us in every single way, yet without sin. So we see about the conception of the virgin birth, how the Holy Spirit played a role in that. And so doing that made him have the two natures for the rest of eternity, right? But we also see that it's helping us guard against any distortion of this understanding. When we tend to overthink this union, we call it the hypostatic union. A lot of errors can happen. So we talked about some of the different errors and heresies in the church when you mess up these understandings, right? So we want to we wanna hold that these are one, yet two natures that are inseparably. So without composition, conversion, confusion. So we're not mixing the two together they still exist. So when we see in the scriptures, maybe we're looking in the Gospels, and we see Jesus weeping, we see him hurting, we see him hungering, we see him sleepy. Um, how do we ascribe that? How do we make sense of that? Well, it's according to what nature? It's human nature, right. When we see God upholding the, wor the world by the word of his power, infinite, um, all-knowing, 
according to what nature is that for Christ? God's nature. God's nature, deity, right? And so we see deity, we see humanity in one. We're not confusing the two. We're not blurring them together to say, okay, now we have like this, uh, you know, kind of like Ovaltine, mix it in milk. You just create it and it's just one substance now. So you're not blurring the two natures together to where you can't tell them apart. There's still two, but we're not separating them so far apart to where now we have two completely different people. Okay, so it's one a person comprised of these two natures that are not that are not uh, uh, un, that are inseparable, undivided. Yet um, we can't mix them together. Okay, so. That is everything up to this point. We now look at paragraph 3, and uh, let's go ahead and read this. It says, The Lord Jesus, in his human nature, thrust united to the divine, and the second person of the Son was sanctified and anointed with the Holy Spirit above measure, having in him all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, in whom it pleased the Father that all fullness should dwell, to the end that, being holy, harmless, undefiled, and full of grace and truth, he might be thoroughly furnished to execute the office of mediator and surety, which office he took not upon himself, but was thereunto called by his Father, who also put all power and judgment in his hand and give him, give him commandment to execute the same. Okay, so I'm going to go through this pretty uh, quickly because we reviewed a lot of this last time. But if you have a question, feel free to raise your hand as I'm going through. And I want to really get to this last section since we didn't get to touch that on that last time. So notice, once again, it's dealing with the natures, the natures we just saw in paragraph two, his human nature and his divine nature. Notice it says, in the, per, in the Lord Jesus, his human and, and divine nature are united in one person, right? The person of Jesus Christ. Two natures united, um, we talked about that the, the Savoy Declaration added this word or this phrase in the person of the Son, particularly to just uh, distinguish. What do we mean by this uh, human nature is united to the divine? Uh, they're just saying it's happening in the Son. Uh, it's united in the, vine, in, in the divine. And so that's an addition from what Westminster adds, uh, has there. No, nothing that they're disagreeing with. They're just wanting to clarify the person of the Son. Notice why this happened. Uh, was sanctified and anointed with the Holy Spirit above measure. So, again, we notice that this paragraph is Trinitarian in nature, right? We see that the Father is the one who, notice you can see a little bit later on, it pleased the Father that all the fullness should dwell, right? You see the Holy Spirit here who has anointed and sanctified Christ as well. And so this is a very Trinitarian paragraph. They're all involved in the person of Christ uh, to execute the plan of being the mediator, right? And so it alludes ultimately to the covenant of redemption going back to where we previewed that there's this plan. They each play a role in that plan, okay? Now, notice it says was sanctified. What do we mean by sanctified? Right? We talked about this last time. It doesn't mean like uh, being less and less sinful, right? Like we are. We're sanctified because we have sin nature. So as we are sanctified, that means we're becoming more and more into the image of Christ. We're purging the sin, the remaining sin. We're trying to kill sin in the flesh, right? Now, we can't really say the same thing about Christ, can we? Because... Set apart, right. So Christ is set apart. Were you going to say that, Luke? What's that? Well, Do you have a question? question. Yeah. Yeah, so I think what we were talking about last time was the distinction that you already brought out, but then if we're looking at Christ, we're looking at you know, the Spirit being upon him, that natural progression growing up in all of that pertains to obedience to God's law. Mm -hmm. But there was a natural way in which that continued through that historical context because it needed to be a full God man. Right. Note. 
Yeah, and so this is all for the purpose of equipping him to be our mediator, right? The God-man. So he's sanctified. In other words, he's set apart particularly for this role to be our covenant mediator, to be the one who will redeem us, to pay for our sins. He will be that, particularly that person, right? Um, we're sanctified by the Holy Spirit to be made more into the image of Christ. He's set apart, sanctified in that light to accomplish this for us, um, to pay for our sins. So we're sanctified not in the same way that Christ is sanctified. Just a word that means set apart, uh, for a distinct purpose. Also, we see and anointed, uh, and it's, it's uh, modified by the phrase, by above measure. So we talk about the role of the Holy Spirit being involved in his life, and this is to say there was no limitation here. There was no um, just m mere like, oh, he's you know 50% measure of the Holy Spirit's power here. No, he had the fullness above any measure. Uh, there was no limitation. Uh, God gave certain measures of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament to kings, to prophets, right? Because kings were supposed to be a picture of God's anointed. It was an image, it was a type that pointed forward to the true anointed one of God. And so they were an, uh, anointed by a measure of the Holy Spirit. There are pictures of anointed ones. Um, and uh, we see this with Saul. He was filled with the Holy Spirit when he was made king. Right? But later on, that measure was taken from him as he was disobedient. Um, it was prophesied that Christ would be that anointed one. We see in Isaiah 11, 2, And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Right? And so we argued last time that we see that even in his childhood. Right? So he was anointed above all measure with the Holy Spirit, even from his childhood. It didn't just merely happen at his baptism, but even from childhood, we see this, right? In Luke 2.52, he increased it, what? In wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man, right? So he was doing everything for the purpose of being our mediator of the covenant of grace. Even in the childhood, as he was tempted, as he was uh, going through various uh, trials in, even that we all face in childhood, um, he had a special anointing of the Holy Spirit that empowered him to have perfect righteousness during that time, to be perfectly obedient, to have a fear of the Lord. And notice he, too, had to grow in wisdom. He, this is the God of the universe, the true word in flesh, who also grew in wisdom and knowledge. He had to learn like us. He had to grow in this. And, and how is that? Well, we see that's according to his humanity, right? Right? Um, sometimes that boggles our minds to think of that. Um, but this is an inseparable union of these two natures in the person of Jesus. And the Spirit was his companion, we can say, throughout his life, throughout his ministry, to equip him to accomplish this work. Uh, John the Baptist told of this Spirit baptism that Jesus would do, right? He says, I baptize with water, but one's coming after me who will baptize you with fire and with spirit, Luke 3.16. Um, so his water baptism anticipated when Jesus would be baptized, right? And so when Jesus is baptized, anointed with the Holy Spirit, in Luke 3 we said he, would been, he, was, he had been baptized, he was praying, the heavens opened up, the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove, and a voice came down from heaven, you are my beloved son, with you I'm well pleased. We can say this is the, the public um, anointing here of coronation is a better word, I think we would say. The public coronation to say, this is my king. This is my son in whom I'm well pleased, who is, in other words, he's perfectly righteous. He's doing all that I've commanded of him. I'm well pleased with him. The spirit descends on him in this new fullness, we can say, in a unique calling. Um, and it's identifying him as the promised Messiah publicly. Right? This is the anointed one that we see in Isaiah 42. Isaiah 42 talks about this anointed one of the Lord. In Psalm 2, it talks about saying, my anointed, my, uh, it's the son, the king who will rule. Right? So Christ is pictured as the true king, the true anointed one. And so through his life, he is equipped, he's empowered by the Holy Spirit beyond measure. Any, any thoughts or comments on that? See it manifested when he 
was teaching and people said, where did he get this? And even as a child, mm -hmm. he was teaching. So he came with the, the information of the, all the scriptures still in his mind and instantly. Yeah, it was a specific wisdom that was given beyond what like scribes and Pharisees even had because uh, they recognized that this is like, how did he have such wisdom being so young? Um, he, yeah, he still learned. He still grew. He learned from uh, some of the scribes and, and teachers of that day. But they recognized he was uniquely gifted in this way by the Spirit. And so we see immediately after his baptism, Luke 4.1, he's led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Right? So the Spirit was leading him to accomplish all that was required of him according to the plan the Father gave him. Uh, for Christ, what's a covenant of grace for us was really a work for him. He was doing this. He was meriting righteousness. He was doing all that was necessary so that we could live. So for us, for us, we're in by grace because he accomplished it all. So the Spirit was equipping him for that. So he's led into this wilderness by the Spirit to be tempted. right? And in so doing, we see Satan come with his temptations and empowered by the Holy Spirit, he's able to overcome them. He's able to say, thrust says the Lord. He's doing what Adam failed to do. He's overcoming temptation and not giving in. He's being obedient. Adam was in a garden with everything he could ever want, every tree he could ever eat, except the one tree that he was prohibited from. And that's the one that Satan came and tempted him and said, has God really said? And as a result... Jesus, the true and better Adam, uh, is doing what Adam failed to do, right? For the purpose of earning life for us. Because God demands perfect law-keeping, perfect righteousness. Well, Christ has to be our representative, and he's doing that for us. We see him actively obeying by the power of the Holy Spirit throughout his life. Isaiah or Luke uh, 4.18, Jesus is in the... Uh, in the temple, he's, he's reading and he quotes Isaiah 61, right? What does he say? He says, uh, this is fulfilled in your hearing, right? And it's speaking of that anointed one who's going to come, who's going to free the captives. And he says, that's me. The Holy Spirit also gave him the ability to perform miracles, right? Matthew 12, 28. Matthew 12, 28 speaks of those things. I believe we read it last time. We want to read it again. Someone read Matthew 12, 28. Matthew 12, 28. But if it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. So the Pharisees are there questioning him, how do you do these things? And they accuse him, oh, well, you're doing this by the, you know, the power of Satan. He says, that makes no sense. But if I'm doing this by the power of the Spirit, by the power of God, then truly the kingdom of God has come. In other words, the Holy Spirit gave him the ability and also established the miracles he was able to do. In Acts 10.38 38, um, we see the Gentiles hearing the good news. Peter is preaching and uh, he talks about Jesus' ministry, and he says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses. So they're pointing out the Holy Spirit was in his life. We see it in his miracles, and that's a testament. He is who he says he was. The kingdom of God has come upon you. God was with him. Um, and so that is, that is a pretty neat thing there. Um, and then the same spirit we brought out last time, the same spirit who was within Christ is also in us. Jesus says this in John um, 3.34, Whoever receives the spirit sets the seal on this, that God is true. For he whom God has sent utters the words of God, for he gives a spirit without measure. Um, and the three confessions all strive to really hammer this point that the spirit was in Christ. Uh, he is the true messenger of the Lord. 
And as we are then entrusted to take that message of proclamation of what Christ has done, we also are empowered and emboldened by the Holy Spirit, right? We saw that in Paul's life through 2 Timothy, right? As he has that special empowerment by the Holy Spirit, he says the Holy Spirit, he was with him. Uh, Christ stood with him. Um, notice it says this, having in him all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, in whom it pleased the Father that all fullness should dwell. Okay, so this is, as we brought out last time, just direct quotations from uh, some of the scriptures that describe who Christ is. So Colossians 2, it says this, that their hearts may be encouraged being knit together in love to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Okay, so... Wisdom and knowledge are seen ultimately in Christ. Every, all that wisdom is meant to point us ultimately to Christ. We see that in the Proverbs. We see that in some of the Psalms as well. There's true knowledge that is seen in him. So we might try to come to certain understandings and knowledge, but apart from having our eyes opened by Christ, by being united to him, we're blinded to truth. Um, in him is all the treasures of wisdom. Um, we want to know what is wise. It's not just do this and do that. It's looking to Jesus. Um, notice it, whom it pleased the Father that all fullness should dwell. Colossians 1.19. This is a quotation from this. Speaking of he is the head of the body, the church, the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. So any, any comments on, on this that we've seen here so far? Mike? Just one comment that you've expounded on just to remember is he took upon himself the human nature, but the part he did not take is man gets sick, and that's part of the fall. And so he didn't get sick. Yeah, um, we see something in here, the common infirmities thereof, uh, that little sentence there. Um, and, you know, that we don't have any record that, you know, Christ had a fever or anything like that in the scriptures. I mean, it's possible that there was sickness if he got tired, if he got hungry, if he wept, um, I would assume he went through all the different same of emotions and infirmities. But will we not in eternity have those same things? Will we not eat? I mean, I'm not saying we're, gonna, we're not going to get sick or anything like that. But what my thoughts are is Adam and Eve in the initial of creation, there was no sickness. Mm -hmm. It's Pre-fall, yeah. and that's the nature that Christ is exemplifying to us. Yeah, so we need to remember too also, Christ, Adam came into the world that wasn't corrupted by sin yet. Christ came into a world that was corrupted by sin. Just the sinful nature wasn't on him. He still experienced the different turmoils that sin causes. Um, but um, how much of that is a direct correlation to actual sickness and disease that he felt? I don't think, scriptures really aren't, uh, they're kind of silent on that. I think we can assume, you know, maybe, you know, did he get chicken pox when he was a child? I don't know. It's possible uh, because he went through all those common infirmities thereof, but the difference is he wasn't, he hasn't been glorified yet. Um, in heaven, when he's glorified, then all those common infirmities, the things, the weaknesses of the flesh um, will be made in a way that is absolutely perfect. We don't have those weaknesses anymore. So in glorification, um, we're not going to have those tendencies. Luke? Well, I'm thinking, like last week, you brought up Hebrews 2.17. Right? Mm -hmm. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, 
so that you might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. You take that into consideration of, do we sin when we're sick? Yes. So, in that respect, I would reduce that he was like us in every respect, yet not sick. So, how else would he sympathize with our weaknesses to its complete fullness? Yeah, and I think it's very possible that that happened, um, mainly because he hasn't been glorified yet. He's taking upon our nature the infirmities thereof. But he's doesn't mean, you know, he's still encountering the nature that has been, um, that comes into the sinful world that has to deal with the effects of sin. Um, Adam didn't have to deal with that till after he was cast out. Um, and the world was then tainted. Um, so, see that now because he lamented, he was sad. Mm -hmm. And at the point of glorification, that's not what would take place. Yeah, and so we need to remember that Christ was tempted not in a garden, not in a perfect paradise like Adam was. He was tempted in the wilderness that was affected by the depravity of man. And so to that extent, it was so much harder for Christ than what Adam had. But Christ was still victorious because he had the measure of the Holy Spirit that equipped him particularly for that task. Um, yeah, good question. Notice it says, to that end, being holy, harmless, undefiled, and full of grace and truth. So the Holy Spirit helped him to be holy, set apart from sin, to be harmless. He wasn't one who sought you know, revenge to harm someone else. He was undefiled. He he never had to be um, uh, tainted by uh, the things of the sinful flesh. Doesn't mean it didn't affect him in certain ways. Um, you know, according to Jewish law, um, Jesus touched a dead body. He healed a girl who was blind. He, he touched a corpse, right? And those were things that would say, oh, you're defiled in the flesh. Well, according to ceremony, right, that was meant to be a picture that would point but that was to be, you know, to be to go through uncleanliness as a ceremony uh, was just a, a picture to show us that ultimately um, this is the causes of sin. This is what it does. But Jesus willingly, uh, we can say, trade places with the leper. Right? He touched him. He was the one who left. He was cast out. The leper was the one who was made clean, and he went in to the town. Right? And so Jesus willingly subjected himself to all the infirmities of the flesh for the sake of healing them because they didn't affect him. Rather, his healing grace affected the people. Right? So the superstition was, oh, if you touch a leper, you know, then you're, you're uh, unclean. Well, Christ had the reverse effect. Perfect. Perfection. Uh, and what did he do? He, he touched them and they were made clean. Um, full of grace and truth. So in Christ, there is the fullness of grace and truth. We see grace, undeserved favor. Um, Christ came and he took upon himself what we deserve. Right? There's nothing deserving in us that said, Christ, you need to pay for our sins. No, there was nothing that we did because of it. It was full of grace. It was out of his love. Um, and he did all these things as our perfect representative, right? As Luke was bringing out, he had to be our perfect high priest to sympathize us with in, in all our weaknesses. Hebrews 7, 26, For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separate from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. Why? Because the high priest was the mediator between God and man. And so he had to go to God as our representative, but all human priests were stained, defiled, they were sinners, and so they couldn't remain in God's presence without the sacrifice for themselves, too. Christ came as one perfect, unstained, undefiled, separate from sinners because he never sinned, and he's our perfect representative between God and man. Right? And so uh, we see in John uh, 1.14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. So in him, he's the embodiment of these things. Notice it says, he might be thoroughly furnished to execute the office of mediator and 
maturity. So the purpose of these, this equipping was so he can be equipped for the task of accomplishing the office of mediator and surety, our guarantee, our guarantor, um, the down payment to say this is absolutely going to happen. Um, he took it upon, uh, he did not take it upon himself to take this office. He voluntarily, the father assigned it. Jesus voluntarily agrees to the terms out of love for his father and love for us. So notice it says, but it was therefore thereunto called by his father. So the father called him to do this task. When would this, did this happen? Well, during the covenant of redemption. The father gave him this appointment to accomplish the redemption of those who have been elected before the foundations of the world. The father is the one who chose them. The son is the one who would spill his blood for them. Right? And the father said, son, you are going to do this. And he says, I will, out of love for his father. Then the Holy Spirit then empowers him to accomplish these things. Notice this last part, and we'll end with this. Who also put all power and judgment in his hands and gave him the commandment to execute the same. So it pleased God to choose and ordain Jesus to accomplish this task. He's going to be our mediator. He's going to represent us. He's clean, undefiled, holy, and harmless. He's our perfect high priest. He's perfectly obeying the law set apart for this task. The Holy Spirit's empowering his entire ministry to execute uh, these, um, the miracles that he does, to execute uh, going to the cross and being able to endure the sins of everybody who had ever existed and placed their faith in him. He absorbed the full wrath of God and he was empowered by this as the Father appointed him for this task before the foundations of the world. Yes, in his humanity, he cried out to the Father, if it's possible, let this pass. Right? No one wants to go through what he went through as a human. But because of that, to the great extent, um, he submitted to the will of God in his human flesh. And he was able to do these things equipped by the Holy Spirit. In so doing, as he accomplished this task as our mediator, now there is no other name by which people might be saved. Right? Jesus says, I am the door. There's only one way to the Father. It's through him. So because of that, because he accomplished this, this work, God has then given him, the Father has put all power in judgment in his hand. He's delegated power and authority to Christ. And in so doing, right, we see this in the Great Commission. All power and authority has been given to me, therefore go and preach. Right? That's to say, look, who are you to fear? Are you going to fear earthly kings? I am the king of kings. I am the Lord of lords. All power and authority and judgment has been handed to me. So that's, that's a very empowering kind of commandment he gives us to say, there's no one else to fear. Hey, this is your mission. Go do it. Um, let's look at Daniel 7. There's quite a few proof texts here that we can look through for this. Uh, John 5 is another one. But let's turn to Daniel 7. I'll, I'll bring up a few, a few of these as well. So real quick, John 5, 22, it says, For the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son. Uh, verse 27, he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the son of man. Pick up on that word, son of man. Where do you hear that again? Daniel 7. Okay. What's that? Hello. Okay, I thought my batteries were dying. So John 5, 22 to 27 um, talks about this judgment that the father gives him. And he says that this judgment belongs to the son of man. So in light of that, Let's look at Daniel 7. And it's speaking of this Son of Man. Look at verse 13. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a Son of Man. 
And he came here to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom, that all peoples, nations, language should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. And if you even uh, look before that, um, you can even see this Ancient of Days is the Father, seated on the throne, who has then delegated this authority, this power, particularly to the Son. And he is going to execute judgment. And then in Acts 2, 36, Acts 2, 36, um, we read this, Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. And right before that, what does it do? It quotes Psalm 2. It talks about, sit at my hand until I make your enemies your footstool. So he's the, the king who is going to rule. He is the king who has all dominion, who has judgment, and he is able to execute judgment on all who uh, reject him. His commandment to execute the same. All right, so that's... Paragraph three, any questions on these things? Oh, Ellie? Um, I'm just wondering um, why Jesus had to stay uh, son of man after he went to the world. He said, like, uh, why did he have to what? Stay son of man. Say son of man? Say, you know, part. You know, so. Yeah. To stay human is what you're saying? Yeah, so his two natures now have been forever united um, in the person of Christ. He is now fully divine and is also fully human. So right now, bodily, he is on the throne in his human nature as well as his divine. Um, And that's to be our perfect representative. Um, So when we go to heaven and are united, we have one... Uh, a picture of who God is in the person of Christ, who is like us because he became like us in every way, yet without sin. And so he's our, what the Bible says, our elder brother who went before us, who was raised and glorified. And um, as in so doing, he's the one we're going to worship for all eternity. Um, boggles our mind to think about that, but yeah, he'll never just be deity and that's it. He's not just spirit, and that's to the extent of how much he loved us because he took upon himself a human nature for the sake of redeeming us so we can be united to him for all eternity. And, um, and um, you know, Ephesians talks about that. That's great humility, that he assumed our nature for our sake. But also it's, it talks about we're his bride, and he's our great husband. And so in... And and that, we get to actually see and behold him. And, uh, yeah, so that's something just to contemplate. And I think the more you think about that, the more you see the love of Christ for his church. Yeah, good question. Um, One more verse. Uh, Let's see, I don't know if I already read this. John 5. John 5, 22. Yeah, I read that. The Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Who doesn't, whoever doesn't honor the Son doesn't honor the Father who sent him. He says, Truly, truly, an hour is coming, and is now here, when the dead hear the voice of the Son of God and will live. For as the Father has life in himself, he's granted the Son also to have life in himself. He has given him authority to execute judgment, because he is the son of man. In other words, he is that king, the promised one, the one who's going to sit on the Davidic throne for all eternity. So he says, do not marvel that I said this an hour is coming, who are in their tombs who will hear his voice and come out, those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. In other words, he is the judge. And he says, I judge. Um, He says, I can do nothing of my own. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. So we're caught up in this great love the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit has for one another. 
And uh, in so doing, we have a true and righteous king who will live forever seated on the throne. And as long as we're united to him, as long as we've sought refuge in him, there is peace for us and not everlasting judgment because he's absorbed it for us. He's taken upon himself. That should provoke us to worship. So let's go ahead and pray and we will worship. Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you for Christ, our perfect mediator. We thank you that he fully accomplished this task, that the Holy Spirit uniquely equipped him for this. Lord, we pray that that would better inform us in how we can worship him as we contemplate the love you have for your church. Lord, we are so undeserving, yet you shower us with your grace and love. We thank you for that in Christ's name. Amen.